Hello and welcome back to episode 6 of charlie.inkspired. I'm so excited for this week's episode, it's... that's probably the wrong thing to say. It's really tragic and really gruesome, but it's really fascinating and it brings us across so many topics. But before we get into that, let's just have a catch up, shall we? How has your week been? I've been, yeah, back, back to full time work. Something I have finished is the new Netflix documentary, which is called Can I Tell You a Secret? I urge you to go watch it. It's really interesting. There's a lot of like police misconduct, the way they haven't dealt with things properly in certain cases about stalking. And stalking is a really difficult thing to kind of convict. And they talk about that in this series. And it's just really interesting. It's a two-parter. Definitely recommend you go watch it. Yeah, really intense. But... That's the world we live in nowadays, you know? Also, shout out to those of you that did watch last week's episode. <laughs> it was really complex, really confusing, but it was kind of a fun one to do. Um, and if you want more like that, which is more based on storytelling than going in depth, tell me. I'm so up for doing more of those. Um, it was a bit of a different one. So this one's kind of, this week's episode's kind of back into the usual in depth, nitty gritty stuff. So, sorry. <laughs> Today, we are going into a huge complex, dark, twisted case. But before I say any more about it, I have to give my usual disclaimer. I mean no harm nor disrespect to the victims or families involved in these cases. This episode was researched by myself and myself only with the information that's already available online in articles and documentaries. This case contains details about BDSM, rape, torture, blood, violence, and murder. So if that isn't something you're in the headspace for, then please pause now and come back another time. And as always, I do put my opinions into these cases. Please remember that these are my opinions and my opinions alone. And as you are entitled to yours, I'm also entitled to mine. So with all that being said, let's take a breath. <sighs> okay, let's begin. Normally I like to go through these stories in chronological order, but I'm gonna set the scene for you first. Imagine this, it's an autumnal afternoon and you're taking your dogs out for a walk near the forest. But when one of your dogs keeps running deep into the forest, and she's been doing this every day for a few weeks now, and usually she returns pretty promptly after you call her, and she always brings back an animal bone of some sort. But one day she runs off into the woods and you call her, and she doesn't return, and you call and you wait, but she doesn't return. So you go into the woods to try and find her. And you do find her, but when you find her, she's chewing on a bone that's far bigger than any animal remains you've ever seen before. Then suddenly it dawns on you that for weeks, your dog has been bringing you back human remains. And these remains we are talking about belong to that of 36-year-old Elaine O'Hara. So what on earth happened to this woman for her remains far beyond decomposition to be found by a dog? Well, let's begin by getting to know our victim a little better. Elaine was born on the 17th of March 1976, and she was born in Dublin to her parents Frank and Eileen. The family lived in a very small seaside town on the coast just south of Dublin, and they had a really happy start to Elaine's childhood. She was described as happy, loving, and she was always really, really good with children. Elaine worked as a daycare worker, so she spent all day every day looking after other people's kids, playing with them, and just, yeah. I worked in a nursery myself, so I can relate to this a lot. I did spend a lot of my time, you know, just playing with the kids. Messy play, paint, cleaning up after them. Whatever you did to look after kids. And you know what? It was a really rewarding job because you do grow really attached to the children. And it was one of Elaine's life goals to have children of her own someday. For some people, it's just a natural calling. And some people are just naturally really good with kids. And they know that they are destined to be a parent. And Elaine was one of these people. Growing up, Elaine watched her mum be a loving primary teacher. And she wanted to follow in her footsteps. Sadly, Elaine didn't quite get the grades she needed from school to be able to do this, but she was able to get this daycare job, which still involved her passion. And in secondary school, Elaine started really struggling with her mental health. She was initially diagnosed with dyslexia, which really knocked her confidence. She was suddenly scared to give answers in class in case they were wrong. And her ability to communicate with others took a really big hit in this. And that's quite often the case, especially when you're diagnosed kind of late in secondary school. You've often missed the chance to get a lot of the help early on. And as often is the case in secondary school, Elaine also started getting bullied. And as a result of all of this, she started struggling quite badly with depression. And she didn't have that many friends to talk to. But sadly, when Elaine was 15, one of her friends that she could talk to tragically died in a car accident. 
which only accelerated Elaine's mental health issues further, as it would do. You're 15 years old, you don't have that many friends, you're going through a tough time, and the one person you can talk to is tragically and suddenly taken away from you. That's going to have a massive impact. And it did impact Elaine massively. And sadly, when Elaine was just 16 years old, she first attempted suicide. And this was the beginning of a lot of attempts and a long journey of self-harm, low mood and suicidal thoughts. But after this initial attempt, she was hospitalised and given an emergency assessment by a psychiatrist, where they diagnosed her with depression and borderline personality disorder. And we're going to pause there on the timeline quite quickly because you know, if you know me, you know my content, you know I cannot talk about BPD without talking about my personal experience with BPD. Because I myself have borderline personality disorder, or BPD as I like to call it, because it's just frankly less of a mouthful. I was diagnosed at 19 years old, I'm 27 now, so I've spent most of my adult life trying to learn how to live with it, how to cope with it. So I feel like I can give a good insight into this in cases like this where the victim, sometimes even suspects, you know, have BPD. Of course, it's a human thing to have. I feel like I can give a really good insight that maybe other people can't. So by definition, BPD is a personality disorder characterised by severe mood swings, impulsive decisions, impulsive behaviour, and difficulty forming stable relationships. With this also comes disturbed patterns of thinking, feelings of chronic emptiness, and body dysmorphia. But each person who has BPD or lives with BPD has a completely different experience from the next. While someone may really struggle with their identity, another person may just really struggle with their relationships in their life, for example. So no two people are the same, and it's important to remember that. The cause of BPD is unclear, but it's believed to be caused by trauma. And it's a really difficult disorder to explain to other people because it's described as one of the most painful personality disorders to ever be diagnosed with. Because, I mean, think about it, you feel everything really intensely. It's going to feel like physical pain sometimes. People hear the word borderline and they immediately begin to freak out. They think this means split personality or, you know, they're destined to be a murderer or they're on the borderline of being insane, which is wrong. People with BPD can split, but that's not splitting into another personality. Think of it as a I hate you, please don't leave me kind of situation. People with BPD can often split from you're the love of my life to get out of my life within seconds. And that's what I mean by splitting. BPD can also lead to other disorders like eating disorders, drug and alcohol abuse. And it's really, really common for people with BPD to attempt suicide multiple times. But one common theme for people with BPD is abandonment issues. So it's no wonder that in Elaine's case, when her close friend died, this really escalated everything for her. BPD sadly can't be cured, but it can be treated with medication and or therapy. You can learn the skills that you need to live a happy, comfortable life and support yourself. Sure, I'm a human being, I still have bad days where it's a little bit too much for me to handle, or I feel like my brain is just too broken to function. But when I look back now, as a 27-year-old woman, to what I was at 19 years old when I was diagnosed, I'm a completely different person. You know, I'm in a healthy relationship, got a full-time job with Responsibilities. (laughs) Responsibilities. <laughs> I'm a homeowner. You know, I look after cats. I care for my family. These are all things that I never thought would be possible for me. And in fact, these were things I was told I would never achieve when I was diagnosed. And that's not a unique experience. So I will always use my platform to discuss mental health and BPD and my experiences to try and shed some light onto it and kind of be a hope story. Like, I'm not saying, like, oh, you know, I'm cured, nothing like that. Of course not. But if I had been able to look up to someone who has kind of overcome a lot with it. When I was first diagnosed, that would have helped me a lot. Because when I was diagnosed, you didn't talk about it. (laughs) Um, So I want to kind of break that chain. So we did go on a bit of a tangent there about myself for far too long, but it's important to the story. So back on to Elaine. Elaine was discharged from the hospital at 16 years old with a cocktail of medications. And what these medications did was numb her symptoms. And numb they did, Elaine really struggled to settle on these meds. She was exhausted, falling asleep mid-conversation with her friends and family, and she was just a shell of her former self. And that can sadly often be the case with, like, specifically SSRIs, like antidepressants. For some people, it can really help control or level their symptoms out, and that's awesome. If you're one of those people, good for you. But for other people, it can just really numb everything, which I know I found in my case, it made me just kind of this numb human being and I couldn't I wasn't myself or I wasn't human like it didn't I began to not feel real and it was really it was almost like it was masking my symptoms 
which only meant that I didn't deal with what I was feeling or deal with what I was upset about. I actually found it easier to support myself when I could feel what I needed to feel and learn why I was feeling what I was feeling. But there is no right or wrong answer to BPD, everyone is completely different. So when Elaine finished school, she started working as a daycare assistant. She was also diagnosed with asthma and diabetes. Both of these limited her physically quite a lot. She didn't have that many close friends, but she was really, really close to her family still. She'd go to work, see her family whenever she could, and repeat. And despite, you know, her struggle with mental health, they were all really supportive of her and she loved them. And I'm really glad that she had that supportive network for her. But unfortunately, in 2002, when Elaine was 26 years old, her mum passed away. Elaine was, understandably, distraught. She knew that she hadn't dealt with death very well prior, and this was only going to trigger those abandonment issues even further. So, to get ahead of the curve, she went back to therapy. In this therapy, she spoke about her mum passing. Feelings of abandonment, low mood, suicidal thoughts, depression, you know. But Elaine also started discussing these fantasies that she was having. And these fantasies included being kept as a slave in a sexual nature. And the psychiatrist noted this down to almost be obsessional. And we are in no way going to be kink shaming in this video, each to their own. But it is common for people with BPD to have risky sexual behaviour. Like literally one of the signs to look out for BPD is risky sexual behaviour, i.e. unprotected intercourse, sex with strangers. I think it's often the case that people with BPD can feel quite numb, so something like this can kind of make them feel alive, or fulfil that kind of element of thrill or danger, I guess. So it's unsurprising to me personally that Elaine wanted to dabble in this. And up into her 30s, Elaine continued to struggle with her mental health, and sadly she did attempt suicide multiple times. Which, again, is really common for BPD, people tend to not really start to settle till they're about 30 years old. And her family were there every single time, like the amount of times her family walked in on her face down in the bathroom after overdosing was a lot. Which, yeah, that can't have been easy for them, so shout out to them for continuously being there. And this whole time, Elaine had been seeing her therapist, seeing a psychiatrist, taking her meds, and she was admitted to a hospital ward on a regular basis. But it wasn't really doing the trick for her. You know, what works for one person isn't going to work for another. And in 2007, Elaine got a new psychiatrist. And this psychiatrist looked at her previous plan and was like, right, well, it's not working, so let's do something new. So she reduced her med dose and started her on a CBT, or Cognitive Behavioural Therapy course and it started to work. Elaine started to learn the key skills she needed to support herself and, you know, combat these feelings of low mood and suicidal thoughts. And in 2012, she actually admitted herself into hospital after experiencing suicidal thoughts, which is a huge turning point for someone with BPD, because it's proof that she didn't want to be feeling that way, she wanted to get better, she didn't want to give in to those thoughts, and she was quite scared by them. So she went to go get help to stop her from doing anything stupid. And it's important to remember that in this case, she wanted to get better. She continuously fought to get better. So store that in your mind because that comes up later. So on what was her 14th and final stay in a hospital, she spoke to multiple therapists and psychiatrists about these dark sexual fantasies she was having. And I don't think that's a particularly uncommon thing to talk about with your therapist, especially if it's constantly on your mind. And especially if what you're fantasizing about is a form of self-harm in a way. And the therapist noted that she seemed really submissive throughout all this conversation. She wanted to be dominated. And as close as she was with her family, they didn't really know this side of her. And I can see why. You, you know, wouldn't discuss this with your father. Um, <laughs> but for most people around her, it turns out this was a completely secret double life she was leading. So in this final stay in hospital, she was in hospital for a couple of weeks and she got better every day. By the time she was discharged, nurses noted how excited she was to just get out and start living her life because Elaine had given herself something to look forward to. She was due to volunteer at a local festival in Dublin and she was so excited. She'd worked really hard on herself in therapy and she was working towards this goal of getting out and being well enough to be able to volunteer for something that she really wants to do. And she did it. She got discharged the day before this festival. And this was on the morning of Wednesday, the 22nd of August, 2012. And she had everything planned out. On the morning of the festival on the 23rd, she was due to get picked up by her father's girlfriend, Sheila. So in the evening, Sheila texts Elaine to just be like, hey, I'll come pick you up from yours tomorrow morning around half seven. But Sheila never got a response. And it wasn't that unusual. Maybe she'd already gone to bed because she had an early start the next day. Maybe she was tired. I mean, she did just get out of hospital. She probably just wanted to shut off from the world for a bit. So on the morning of the 23rd, Sheila drove to Elaine's flat to go pick her up. She texted and called to say she was outside, but Elaine didn't answer. 
and she didn't come out the door. Sheila even got out of her car and started banging on the door, ringing the doorbell, but nothing. Lane's car wasn't even in the flat car park, so maybe she'd driven herself to the festival? Sheila called Frank to let him know that Elaine wasn't answering and her car wasn't there, so I think she drove herself to the festival? But I haven't heard from her. So Frank went to Elaine's flat with a spare key and let himself in. Everything looked normal, nothing was out of place, nothing was like particularly messy or like there'd been a fight or anything like that. Except one thing, they found Elaine's iPhone on the kitchen side still charging. Why would she go out without her phone? More importantly, why would she go to a festival that she was working all day without her phone? She was always glued to her phone, so it seemed really unlikely that she would do that. But given Elaine's history, maybe she just wanted to get away for a while. So her father let it be for a bit and gave her until the next day. But by the 24th, they still hadn't heard from Elaine at all. Frank called the local hospital to see maybe whether she'd admitted herself again. Maybe she was back in hospital. But no, they hadn't heard anything from her since she was discharged. He also rang the festival and the events coordinators to see whether she showed up for her shift. But this is where Frank found out that Elaine never arrived for her shift. So it's safe to say at this point, her family were really, really worried. So with no sign of her whatsoever, they ring the police and report her as missing. And of course, immediately this was taken seriously because she was a very high-risk missing person, given her history of suicide attempts. And police start by searching Elaine's flat to see if they can find any indication to where she was or if she was going to meet anyone. And there was no evidence that the reason she disappeared had anything to do with the flat itself, so it looked like she went out and disappeared, if you know what I mean. However, they did start to uncover the secret life of Elaine. So initially they found her sex drawer by the side of the bed, you know, full of toys, rope, handcuffs, masks, chains, PVC suits, that kind of stuff. But there was also a notebook and on the page was a list of fetish websites. Not a totally unusual thing to find in an adult's flat. I think it's no secret that most adults next to their bed have some sort of secret drawer or box hidden under the bed with toys. But the list of websites piqued their interest. And with that, they looked on Elaine's MacBook. Here they discovered the document all about enslaved women and how women only exist as a product to satisfy men sexually. Which I think shows us how seriously Elaine took this fantasy that she was thinking of all the time. But it's one thing to have a fantasy about being submissive. That's not totally unusual, right? But was she actually starting to believe that she was designed to be a product for a man to consume? Perhaps this was a clue to where she went Maybe she was meeting someone. Maybe she was caged up somewhere as a sex slave and couldn't get out. Police also discovered that on the underside of Elaine's mattress, there were blood stains and semen stains, but also stab holes. And like I said, this was on the underside, so it had been flipped at some point. So was Elaine trying to conceal something or was someone else trying to conceal something? But the amount of blood didn't really indicate that she was murdered in her flat and there was no evidence of blood anywhere else, so it was just likely that this was part of a kink thing. So they took DNA samples and sent it off to a lab. Later, those results came back that the blood was a match to Elaine, and they were unable to find a match on their database for the semen sample. So whilst the police were busy looking for things in Elaine's flat, her family were out hitting the town trying to find anything they could find. Where her brother-in-law went to the cemetery. She'd often go here to visit her mum's grave, you know, lay flowers, sit and talk to her mum, visit her. So he thought maybe she went there. And whilst he didn't find Elaine, he did find her car parked in the car park. And this car park was linked to not only the cemetery, but a huge park called Shangana Park. The cemetery was linked, a foresty area with like mountains attached, and also a beach with kind of a cliffside edge. So it had a pit of everything. It was really rural coast of Dublin. So she could have gone to any one of these places, the beach, the forests, the mountains, the park, the cemetery, and they had no idea where to start but police decided to start with the car. Upon searching the car, there wasn't anything too out of the ordinary, except one thing that made them a bit curious. It was a phone charger, but not for an iPhone. And if you're an Apple product user, you know that they are notorious for not complying with any other <laughs> charging device or, you know, USB-C. Not for long though, that law is changing. But she also left her iPhone at the flat and her MacBook at the flat. So did she have another phone? Was it like a secret device? Or was this someone else's charger? But it wasn't long till police found out that she did actually have a second phone, and this would end up being completely vital to the case. Police managed to obtain CCTV from outside Elaine's flat, where they can see her leaving on Wednesday the 22nd of August in the afternoon around 5 o'clock, 5.30. And in her hand was a phone, but not her iPhone. And that was the last time she was seen on CCTV. Police asked the family, you know, did you know anything about this secret sex life or the fantasy she was having, or... Did you know anything about a second phone? But 
they had no idea. So knowing that the last place she took herself was Shangana Park, police go there to try and speak to any witnesses, speak to the public, see if they've seen anything out of the ordinary. Where one member of the public had actually spoken to Elaine on this afternoon. He said he was going out for a jog when Elaine flagged him down to ask for directions. She was asking for directions to a footpath that led to a bridge. He gave her the directions and she turned around and went straight there. He said she seemed slightly spaced out a little bit and maybe even slightly upset, but he didn't think too much of it. So we have a rough idea of the area that she went to, but police couldn't see anything in the specific area that linked to Elaine. So we're back to square one. And months go by with no new leads, no evidence, no sign of Elaine at all. The case begins to go cold. And officers begin to theorise that perhaps Elaine took her own life that day. After all, there was a beach at the end of Shangana Park, so maybe she went down to the beach and took her own life and her body got washed out to sea, which is why there's no evidence at all. And given her history, it seemed really quite plausible, especially the fact that she'd come out of hospital that day. So everyone kind of accepted that this must have been what had happened and they started to move on. That was until over a year later in September 2013, when three men were on a walk in this park, where they crossed a bridge that went over some water. But as they were crossing, something caught their eye in the water. Curiosity got the better of them, as it probably would most people, and they began fishing these objects out of the water. Here they found a vest, a blue hoodie, and a ball of chains, handcuffs, and a mask which had a ball gag attached to it. You know, kind of laughing at this bizarre discovery that they've just found, they put it down to, well, someone's had a wild night, let's just put those on the side of the bridge and say no more. So they moved on. But one man in this group couldn't stop thinking about the things that they found that day. Perhaps they weren't as innocent as they probably initially thought. So this man returned the following day to the bridge to find all these items were still laid up on the side, where he collected them and took them straight to the police and the police took them in as potential evidence. So we're also at the point in the story now where this mischievous little dog found the one thing that the officers couldn't. On the 13th of September, the dog owner went into the forest to try and find where her dog had run off to, where she found her dog chewing on a big bone. And next to this array of remains were a pair of blue tracksuit bottoms. And she immediately thought, oh my God, this could be human remains. So with that, she rang the landowner. And it feels like a very small town Irish thing to do is just like ring the landowner rather than phone the police straight away. But you know, the landowner immediately came and the pair kind of debated whether these were human, whether these were just an animal, until suddenly they spotted the bottom half of human jaw with the teeth still attached. So it was undeniably human. The police were immediately contacted and the minimal remains that were left were taken away for sampling. As you can imagine, the media went crazy and conspiracy theories started coming out of all corners. People that went missing in the 90s were suddenly being brought up in newspaper articles thinking, could this be them? Is this finally the missing piece? But the lab results were able to confirm that these remains, the jaw with the teeth attached, they were able to compare these to dental records where Elaine came up as a match. So with that, Elaine's case was reopened. It's quite striking that the three men found these items in the water at the same time that this dog found these remains. But sometimes life is weird like that and it all happens at once. So officers returned to the water where the men found these remains and luckily they did find more. Here they found a backpack, a Nokia phone, a kitchen knife, handcuffs, rope, an inhaler and a set of keys. Conscious that Elaine had asthma, the inhaler piqued their interest, but the one item that actually was key, funnily enough, was the set of keys because on the keyring was a loyalty card for a supermarket. Bingo. The officers knew that this could link them directly to a name of the owner of the keys. And the supermarket was able to confirm that this specific loyalty card did belong to Elaine O'Hara. Police also discovered not far from where Elaine's remains were found was actually a garden shovel. So it became very suddenly clear that Elaine didn't commit suicide at all. This was quite obviously a murder. So police have bone remains, but no cause of death no body to investigate, belongings linking them to a specific area, but no suspect. So police go back to Elaine's MacBook and phone to see if there's anything they can uncover here. Unsurprisingly, Elaine mostly used this MacBook to access fetish websites, where she had a profile set up titled Help Me Learn, where in a lot of these bio descriptions on these sites, she wrote Help Me Be The Best Slave I Can Be. And Elaine has spoken to multiple members on these sites, but two accounts seem to pique their interest. These accounts were both named Architect77 and Architect72. So it's likely that these two accounts belong to the same person. And I need you to remember the name of these accounts and store them later because they will come up in a big aha moment. 
Elaine had been talking quite frequently to these accounts since 2007, and in 2008, Elaine received an email from fetishboy at gmail.com which said, I'm always thinking of you. I'll gladly carry out what you want me to do. And unsurprisingly, this email was the same email used to set up the Architect77 account. Police were also able to retrieve a ton of deleted files, folders, documents from her MacBook, most of these containing pornographic videos or images. Some of these were of other women, but some of these were also of Elaine, and it's here where they noticed that Elaine had scars all over her body, like torso, back, side, some that she potentially couldn't reach herself, which starts to match up with the mattress with the stab holes all over it. Amongst this, they also uncovered a slavery contract, and this was from September 2010, where it contained the following clause. Slaves are property, possession, meat. They are loved as a pet or cherished as a car. They are not a wife or a mistress. Slavery is a hard lifestyle to endure. You are not just a sex toy, but a complete package. You will be offered an annual slavery contract with no early release for any reason. You will be kept in either a heavy duty cage or in my cellar. If you are good and collect merit rewards, you will earn a bed to sleep on for the night. Now, all of this could be innocent if all parties were consenting. But one thing that showed the officers how dark this was truly about to get was where they uncovered multiple images of dead women. These were stored in a file on Elaine's laptop called Killing. And these women had quite obviously been brutally attacked, tortured, murdered. Now, if you're also part of the Apple gang, you will know that you can link your iMessages to your MacBook and you can see everything, reply to messages on your MacBook. And Elaine did this, and it seemed there was one contact that she messaged every day. This contact was saved as David. It became obvious that David was someone she met from a fetish site, judging by the nature of their conversations, as they found messages like, I'm a sadist. I enjoy others' pain. You should help me inflict pain on you and help me with my fantasies. Where Elaine would often reply things like, I'm not into blood anymore. And I really need you to think about Elaine's responses in some of these messages. It's really difficult with relationships where there is an obvious dominant and a submissive to know whether the replies she's giving are really not consenting or whether it's part of this role play. Like, is she just playing a character? But the messages get darker the more they go on, where there is an exchange where Dave says, my urge to rape, stab, kill is huge. You have to help me control or satisfy it. I want to stick my knife in flesh while I am sexually aroused. Blood turns me on. I'd love to stab a girl to death one day. Elaine replied, I don't want you to stab me anymore. Where David said, if you ever want to die, promise I can do it. And she replied, yes, I promise, sir. So who was this David? And was he possibly the same person as Architect 77? So police go back to the hospital to speak to the staff and any other patients that were there at the same time as her last hospital visit. And Elaine had mentioned to other patients and nurses in the hospital about this married man that she was seeing for regular sex. And she mentioned how he was constantly trying to get her into role-playing, bondage games, and even getting her into knife play. So seemingly David wasn't as secret as we once thought. But we can see from these messages that Elaine clearly sets a boundary to say no to knife play. She literally says, no, I'm not into blood anymore. But judging by the messages that go on, it seems kind of clear that knives did come into the bedroom with these two. Did she change her mind or was she left with no choice by her dominant? And we have to remember that Elaine was really, really vulnerable and probably really easy for someone to manipulate. And whoever this David guy was, he knew this. He would often make promises to get her pregnant and help her fulfill her dream of becoming a mother, but in exchange for her helping him commit murder. And throughout all of these exchanges, we can just see his desire to kill intensify day by day. David even came up with a plan for Elaine for a fantasy swap. He theorized that they could book a house viewing, pretending to be a couple, and then the real estate agent that was showing them the house, he could rape and torture and kill. He promised Elaine that if she helped him do this, he would then take her back to his and impregnate her. I'm glad to say this plan never carried out. It just goes to show the manipulation that's starting to go on here. And it's also in black and white for officers to see that he's actually quite serious about this. Whoever this man was, his fantasies or desires were intensifying to the point where he's making plans to do this. And it's odd that initially he goes from wanting Elaine to help him to suddenly wanting Elaine to agree to be the victim. I can't ever wonder, is it because it's harder to do with a stranger or did he think that Elaine was possibly easier to manipulate into saying yes? And we start to see messages where David really starts to put Elaine down. He calls her fat, 
ugly and worthless. And he even began using her suicide attempts against her by saying things like, if you just let me stab you, I'd be doing you a favor. Almost as if he was angry that she would try to do it herself when he's like, hello, I'm offering to do it for you. But as we said earlier, Elaine didn't want to die. She wanted to get better. And these types of messages become more frequent from David with messages of him offering to put her to sleep. Elaine would often reply, stop. But David would come back with, I know you want it. 30 seconds for you to slip into oblivion. I have everything ready if it all becomes too much. Just think, all your worries are gone. I can fit you in Thursday. Elaine stuck to her ground and said, right now, I'm not that bad. Firstly, I'll fit you in Thursday. Ugh. I'm sorry, what? It's so matter of fact, such like a business interaction. But she's clearly not wanting this. And she's telling him that she doesn't want to die. She doesn't even want to be cut. She's making it very clear that she does not want to be his victim, but he keeps on pushing. Almost like he's trying to break her down and convince her to say yes. Which is so, so dangerous. Because all it takes is one bad day and for him to say exactly the right thing and for her to go, you know what, yeah, I agree. But spoiler alert, Elaine never agrees to be murdered. From these texts, the police can tell that Elaine had been having regular sex with this person. So they gather CCTV from Elaine's flat six months prior to her disappearance. And with over 5,000 hours of CCTV footage, they see one man coming in over 12 times. And these visits seem to coincide with the types of messages that are being exchanged between David and Elaine. And in this CCTV, he was also wearing the same backpack that was discovered in the water. And he was wearing it every time he came to visit. Another thing to note that every time this man passed the CCTV, he would often kind of turn his face away, do something to obstruct it, like put his hand up, put his arm up, right? Except for one time where he forgot. So keep that in your head because we'll come on to that later. And it was painfully obvious that whoever this was in the CCTV was responsible, but they just had no idea who he was. And at some point in 2011, the text moved from iMessage to Nokia phones. And one of the Nokia phones is something that was discovered by police in the water. And they go back and focus on the messages exchanged here, which is our only other real link to the suspect. And surely there's something in these messages that can reveal what type of person this is, what he does for the job, what he does in his spare time. Where on the 30th of March, a bunch of messages were exchanged, which, bingo, gave the police a little bit of an insight into who this was. Elaine said, are you still on? Wife not in labour or anything? David said, so far, so good. Got fake knives. The next day, Elaine said, I take it you're now a daddy again. Where David replied, yes. Beautiful baby girl. Ick, the fact that he has children and the fact that he has a daughter really disturbs me. But bingo, police were able to work out that he was married and he had at least a two-year-old daughter and perhaps more children as well, judging by the fact Elaine said, daddy again. And slowly, bit by bit, police are starting to picture what this man is like and what his lifestyle is like. And on one day, this mystery suspect revealed that he had a bad day. And when Elaine asked why, he replies saying he'd had a pay cut and he came fifth in flying. And police were baffled by this phrase, fifth in flying. What does this mean? And they begin to look at local pilots in the area. Was there a race going on that day? But they can't find any pilot racing. The fact that he said fifth in flying led them to exactly where they needed to go. Because if he just said, I had a bad day flying, that could mean anything, could have meant he went on a commercial flight. But the fact he mentioned a placement gave officers something to start with. And lo and behold, on the 22nd of May, when these messages were exchanged, there was a local model airplane flying competition. So police contacted the events manager running this competition and requested for a list of names of the competitors, where in fifth place was a man called Graham Dwyer. Graham was a married man with a wife named Gemma. They had a two-year-old daughter. But not only this, Graham was an architect. Ding, ding, ding. We have a match, everyone. Architect 77, David and Graham were all the same person. And with this, we now have a named suspect. So who is Graham? Graham was born on the 13th of September in 1972. He was well-liked in school, fairly popular, doing well at school in his grades. And he always knew he wanted to go into architecture. He went to uni where he got his architecture degree and it didn't take him long to find success. During uni, he got his first girlfriend, Ema, and within months, she fell pregnant. But as the pregnancy progressed, Graham's behaviour towards her completely changed. He suddenly became abusive, controlling, and manipulative. So the minute she gave birth to her baby boy, she went back to her parents to reside in safety. Not long after the birth of his son, Graham met Gemma, who we know he later went on to marry. And Gemma was also an architect student at this uni. They graduated together and started their happy life, where Graham became a successful director of an architect company. He was doing really well for himself and able to provide a very comfortable lifestyle for his family. So back onto the timeline, police start to look further into this Nokia phone. After all, Elaine only left the house with this phone in her hand, and these two numbers had only been contacting each other constantly prior to Elaine's death. 
both this Nokia phone that they had already that they found in the water and the Nokia phone that was linked to the number of master were both purchased in 2011 under a fake name. So whoever bought these Nokias bought them together and most likely for a purpose of them being burner phones. Including this exchange, the day before Elaine's disappearance on the 21st of August, the master phone sends a text that says, if anything happened to you, who knows about me? And Elaine replies, I've told no one about you. But the master phone replies, good, let's keep it that way. You will be bound and gagged, tied to a tree deep in the forest. Elaine replied, I'm not leaving my apartment. You'll have to drag me out. And the master replied, you will do what you are fucking told. I want outdoor play or I'll double punish you and hang you. Yeah, heavy. So police start to look at the masks that this phone pinged to. They've got the number, they can do that. And on the 22nd of August, on the day of Elaine's disappearance, it initially pinged in Galway, but by around 5, 5.30 p.m. it pinged in Dublin. And these are the opposite ends of the country, but Ireland is tiny and you can drive from Galway to Dublin in just under three hours. And you can do this pretty much in a straight line on the motorway using the M6 and the M4. So police look at the CCTV on the motorway near Dublin to see if they can see a specific car that relates to Graham coming in, and lo and behold, they do. They see Graham's blue Audi TT driving into Dublin just before it pinged at the Dublin mast. So they had the Nokia that belonged to Elaine, with all the texts on it. And with the number of the master phone, they were able to locate the mast pings. And since the 22nd of August, it hadn't pinged any further masts, so it's likely that it stayed in Dublin and was dumped with all the rest of the belongings. So police search the water again, and ta-da, they find it. They now have the master Nokia phone, and Elaine's number is saved as slave. On the day of Elaine's disappearance, the master phone texts the slave phone, I found a really remote place, no one will find us. Elaine replied, sir, do I have to be naked? Master replied, it's very deep in the forest, and yes, you do. I don't want blood all over your clothes. The slave phone replied, now I'm terrified. This place, although a pain in the arse, is safe because I know what's coming, and I don't want to leave. Master replied, don't fear death. The slave phone replied, I'm just so scared. Do you know, sir, that I'm scared of you? You have this hold over me that terrified me. And the master replies, you must be punished for trying to kill yourself without me and for being away for so long. Where the slave phone replied, yes, sir, I know. Master needs to punish slave. And the master phone replied, I'm going to get blood on my knife for this. A lot of blood and then we can move on. And the slave phone sends a final message in this exchange, which said, please don't mention kill for a while until I've settled back to life. Again, we don't know how much of this is Elaine genuinely being fearful for her life and not consenting or whether this is part of role play where she's like being the submissive you know but what these messages do show us is that there is a plan in the woods where a knife is bound to be involved you know given the fact that he's told her there's going to be blood on my knife for this and take off your clothes because i don't want them to be covered in blood and as if this already wasn't enough evidence police hit the jackpot with the final messages that were ever exchanged between these two phones the master phone texts the slave phone saying tonight's punishment will be like me pretending to do someone for real okay i want you to park at shangana cemetery at 5 30. leave your iphone at home just bring your slave phone and keys you'll get further instructions here and the final text was go down to the shore and wait with this the police were able to provide a timeline of elaine's death and they were able to link this all to Graham. Police attended Graham's home address in Galway, where he was arrested in front of his whole family. They also attended his workplace, where he was the director for an architect company, where they obtained every single hard drive that could possibly contain any further evidence. And everyone in his life, his wife, his family, his co-workers, were completely stunned by this. How could hardworking, loving Graham be responsible for such a thing? Which I think this only proves how much of a secret second life this was for Graham. He knew it was dark and that it was something that he shouldn't be doing or shouldn't be public about. So Graham was taken in for questioning where he protests that he didn't know Elaine. And Graham isn't very smart in questioning. Granted, I don't really think there was anything he could have said to get him out of it at this point. He's pretty much caught red-handed, given the evidence that he was presented with. But police even show him the CCTV of him entering Elaine's flat up to 12 times, and he's like, no, that's not me. Graham seemed to be more disturbed by the thoughts of his dirty laundry being aired publicly and embarrassing his wife than, you know, the fact that he's being questioned for murder. He just keeps saying to the police, like, I just, I don't want to hurt my wife, you know? And she keeps bringing things back around to his wife. And I can't help but think this is a manipulation tactic here. He's saying, like, look, my poor wife, my children, you can't do this to them. No, Graham. You did this to them. Your wife 
and children will have to live with this for the rest of their life, knowing that you did this. Whilst Graham was in custody, police took a DNA sample, where they were able to match this sample that was found on the mattress. So magically, once Graham was presented with this piece of evidence, he said, okay, yes, I did have consensual sex with Elaine at one point in time. He claimed that he only lied to protect his wife. But Graham still wasn't really letting them in on much. He was being stubborn and just kept talking about his wife. So police circle back to the CCTV outside Elaine's flat, more specifically the backpack that Graham was carrying. Because as we know, he was wearing the backpack that was found in the water on every single one of these visits on CCTV. But he claims, it's not mine. That was Elaine's. She used to keep her BDSM things in it. And I can't help but think, at some point during questioning like this, you would think, uh, I think they have me back to Nicola. Like, I think they already know it was me. Like, he's not even, like, presenting them anything. He's just been like, nah. So it was quite obvious that Graham was the stubborn type. But after days of interrogation, he finally admits that he did know Elaine and that he met her on a fetish website called alt.com. Also, at some point during his incarceration, Graham told the police to check the basement in his office, where they found multiple massive knives. Rumour is that he told the police about this to try and, you know, get on their good side, hoping it would ease his sentence, maybe, or maybe even get him bail. But as we already know, Graham wasn't that smart, because he didn't need to say the words, I killed Elaine. The evidence said it all, and on the 18th of October 2013, he was charged with murder. He tried to get released on bail on three occasions, but these were all denied. And in January 2015, the trial began. This trial lasted a harrowing nine weeks in total. Unsurprising, considering the amount of evidence they had to go through. They had over 448 interviews, over 5,000 hours of CCTV, and over 2,500 text messages. By this point, Graham and Gemma had divorced, understandably so, and Gemma actually took the stand. And while she was on the stand, she shared a letter that Graham had written her whilst he was in prison. In this letter, he tries to explain to Gemma how he knew Elaine, and he's referring to her this whole time as that awful woman. My heart really goes out to Gemma on this case massively, because not only must it have been horrific to find out that your husband did this, but also that he's still contacting you via letters, calling this woman awful. Like, it just makes it worse. Like, if anything, I'd rather them just be like, okay, yeah, I did it rather than just constantly message me or constantly write letters to me to say, oh, you know, she was so awful. But the most vital person to take the stand this day was someone called Darcy Day, who was about to prove the sinister nature of Graham. So this young American lady, Darcy, met Graham on a fetish website. And it seems that Darcy and Graham had a very similar relationship to Elaine and Graham. And they were actually messaging at the same time that Graham and Elaine were messaging also. Darcy revealed to the court how Graham would often send messages of his fantasies about how he wanted to rape and murder women. He would also send Darcy images of dead, tortured, murdered women. Not only this, but he would send Darcy articles of where the arteries were in a human neck, so he knew which one he had to slice in order to kill her. And throughout these messages with Darcy, we can see that Graham was also trying to convince Darcy to be a victim. At the time, Darcy was really struggling with depression, and she was kind of open to the idea of this. And the pair even made plans for Graham to fly out to the US to do it. And as we've seen from his interview process, Graham wasn't the best at covering his tracks. In fact, Graham had told Darcy all about Elaine. He told Darcy that he regularly had sex with Elaine and would cut her whilst they were having sex. But he was getting increasingly frustrated that Elaine wouldn't agree to let him stab her to death. He was venting to Darcy. Poor little Graham. He only wants to murder an innocent woman. Why won't anyone agree to that? And remember all those hard drives that police took from Graham's office? Well, yeah, these were by far nowhere near squeaky clean. In fact, they were far from it, where in court they revealed a document titled Killing Darcy, which was created in 2011, which, surprise, surprise, was an in-depth plan on how Graham was going to kill Darcy. But the prosecution had the big guns on how to prove just how into this Graham was. The judge actually ordered the general public to leave the room because what they were about to show was so graphic he didn't want anyone who didn't have to see it to see it. Police recovered a file titled EH, where in this folder was a bunch of videos of Graham and Elaine having sex. But in these videos, Elaine's mouth is covered with duct tape as muffled screams are pouring out, because whilst they're having sex, Graham is stabbing her with a pen knife in the side multiple times. And yeah, this case is a tricky one to talk about because of the nature of BDSM. I feel like knife play is a kind of popular thing, or at least it's a glamorized thing in today's society. I think it's no surprise that we've all heard of it, but my knowledge of it was prior to this case that it was just like light cutting, not, you know, full on stabbing someone in the side. And I'm not trying to kink shame anyone, you know, it's tricky if both parties are consenting, then in theory, what's wrong with that? 
but it just feels a little extreme to me. But despite all this evidence, Graham was as stubborn as ever, and he was actually convinced he was going to be found innocent. He was boasting to everyone about his plans to treat himself to a steak dinner once he was let out. And I can't work out why exactly he thinks this. Has he made this narrative up in his head that Elaine actually consented to this and therefore he's done nothing wrong? Because Elaine didn't consent to this. So how can he not think that what he did was wrong? And Elaine's family made a really striking point in court where they said, we will never know at what point on that Wednesday where Elaine realized this wasn't a game anymore. At what point did she realize she was about to get killed for real? Unsurprisingly, Graham was found guilty and sentenced to life. But still to this day, Graham is protesting his innocence. And in 2023, this went to appeal. But when it did go to appeal, it went to the Supreme Court, where his appeal was rightfully dismissed. The court agreed with the prosecution that there was enough evidence to support the conviction, even if the disputed call data evidence had been excluded. The judge even said there was no miscarriage of justice in this sentencing. Because Graham was clutching at the fact that there was a change in law since the first prosecution meaning that all the data they collected on the call evidence, including, you know, mass tracking, was suddenly immiscible in court. He genuinely believed that if it went to trial again and without this call data evidence, there's not enough to, you know, pin him to it. Somehow he thought that would get him off scot-free. The court did say, however, it's important to properly characterise the illegality involved in this case, considering that the data obtained was in compliance with the 2011 Communication and Retention of Data Act, but this act was later found to be inconsistent with EU law. So yes, in theory, the call data that was obtained and used in court would be admissible now, but it was clear with all the other evidence that Graham was guilty. And there we have it, guys. That was the case of Elaine O'Hara. Probably one of the most complicated cases, and it's something I will do more cases on, because there are cases where both parties were consenting to strangulation, for example, and it went too far, and therefore they were killed. So where's the line of murder? But yeah, that's a whole other story for a whole other day, so we'll save that for next time. It's time to go do something nice for yourself. Maybe, you know, not touch another human being for a while. Just drink some water, chill out, watch something happy, eat something, do what you need to do, look after yourself. As always, make sure you subscribe. You can click the heart down below or click the subscribe button. Leave a comment. What did you think of this case? What case do you want me to cover next? If you are an audio listener only, please make sure you give me a review. Five stars is obviously preferable, but of course, say what you think. So with that, stay safe and I will catch you next time. Bye.